Hi, everyone, and welcome to Fresh from the Studio. Um, this is our virtual program where we invite women in their work artist members to share what they're working on now um, with you. Each artist will have 10 minutes to present um, their work either through presentation or a studio tour. And then at the end, um, we'll come back together as a group and have uh, questions and conversations with all the artists. During the presentations, feel free to um, write your thoughts or comments into the chat. At the end, we'll address them. Um, and we'll get started today with Christy Batani. Uh, the three artists today, I forgot to mention it, Leslie Pierce, Kirti Sinhai, and Christy Batani. Two of the artists are based in Austin, and one artist is now based in California, but originally from Austin. So let's start with Christy. Great. All right, I'm going to share my screen. And all right, is that working for you all? Yes. yes. All right, well, so first of all, um, thank you so much, Diane, and to Women in Work for having all of us and for all of you that are taking time out of your day to, to join us and to hear about our practices. So again, my name is Christy darnell Batani, and I am a multimedia artist here in Austin, Texas. I create textile inspired two and three dimensional works using outdated texts and printed materials. So I literally keep uh, vintage suitcases full of old manuals, diaries, ledgers, maps, magazines. And often the way I start is to just literally sit on the floor with these, open up the suitcases and start rifling around and see like what of the things I've collected, where are their common threads and stories? So I create both two-dimensional and three-dimensional works from these print sources. Um, and I really prefer mundane print material. So things like manuals, I think manuals are really interesting. And um, I think that how those printed materials like manuals really show how we do things and how they've influenced our perceptions of correctness. So for the two-dimensional pieces, um, I start with multiple layers of print materials mixed with many layers of paint, ink, and other mark making materials. And during the process, I'm constantly uh, distressing the layers, usually by sanding, to represent the passage of time, and then responding to what results from that process to find patterns and lines and shapes that will ultimately form the abstract painting. And so, over the years, I've noticed that the work was taking on the look and feel of textiles. And now I'm very intentional about looking to textile and fiber arts for new ways of mark making um, and patterns and forms that instead of using like fabrics or fibers, I'm using the print materials. And for example, some work has included thread and stitching such as this piece that had boro techniques, which was a Japanese form of mindful mending. So given my reliance on, and I'm gonna see if I, this may be blocking your view. So keep it for now. Um, given my reliance on uh, sound materials, my work really lends itself to collaborative or uh, commissioned work. So a recent commission piece from a private client is a good example of how one project evolved into a new body of work. So the client had a stack of old vintage life magazines that her mother had collected. And she asked if I would do something with those to create a, a personal nostalgic narrative for her. So that's the piece on the left. And uh, the success of that piece then led to another one, which was the piece on the upper right corner, which was uh, from lingerie uh, advertisements and images from those same vintage life magazines. And that was used at the recent Austin Art Bra event and then in turn that work inspired the, um, the art bra for the monochromatic group of work. But in doing those two projects, I started seeing other stories in the photographs and advertisements of the Life magazines. And they felt like they should be a mini series in themselves. 
And Life Magazine is just a really interesting publication. You know, it, it was the first all photograph news magazine in the United States. And its mission was to capture anything that constituted life. And so whether that was boring and uh, mundane or glamorous or heroic or fantastic, uh, they wanted images of that. But as I'm constructing these pieces, I often find that the original story that attracted me is only one of the narratives. And when the text or images are rearranged, you start to see other narratives. And frequently those narratives are about how society sees or wants to see women. So the second thought, uh, then as I'm working on these, again, looking for those patterns and lines, um, I start to try to use those to connect these ideas for the viewer. And so these are some more from that series of work from the Life magazine. And the second body of work that I do is three-dimensional. Um, and these pieces are literally formed from the printed pages, but again, taking cues from textiles, so things like worn quilts or tattered clothing. And the process for these is very different. I begin by hand coloring each page using, using encaustic paint, which is wax based. And the wax soaks into the paper, giving it the color and makes it malleable for shaping. But it's a very tedious, laborious process to prep all the, mater the materials, despite what this video at fast pace makes it look like. Um, and so then it's followed by the layout design phase. But these pieces I think are actually really fun to engage with. Um, it's usually not obvious what the nature of the source material is until you get very close to them. So I think that's part of why they work really well in corporate and public spaces. And for some reason, for the last year or so, everybody wanted sheet music. So I don't know what that's about. But for a while now, I have wanted to do a show that incorporated both of the uh, components of my work, both the two-dimensional and three-dimensional. And so I will have an opportunity to do that in January of 2023 at Georgetown Art Center. And it's going to be a solo show called How To Directions Included. And the idea for this body of work um, came from a 2021 book by Jess McHugh called Americana. And in her book, McHugh has identified 13 of the best-selling books that have shaped our definition of what, what are American values and American ideals. And so she goes back to things like Webster's first dictionary and includes things like Emily Post's Book of Etiquette, Betty Crocker's first picture cookbook, and everything you wanted to know about sex, among others. So right now, I'm in the process of prepping the materials for all of that show and deciding which pieces will be two-dimensional tapestry-like and which will be three-dimensional forms and structures. And I'm also trying to read the book to better inform which format I think will be the most thought provoking for each one. So the idea is that by January, I should have about 25 or so new pieces. And I suppose um, as a bonus, I will have no excuse for not being able to define my goals and master the perfect pie crust and set a proper table. So that's, um, I hope some of you will get the chance to come out in January to see these in person. And as they evolve, I'll try to kind of keep that on social media as well. And that's really it for me today. Thanks so much, Christy. And next up we have Kirti Sunhai. Hi, I'm Kirti Sinha. First of all, I'll share my slide presentation. So I would first like to thank uh, women and their work and Diane and Sophia, sorry. So for having me on this Fresh From Studio series, it's really awesome to see how art can influence so many people in so many different ways. It's totally different for everybody. So something about myself, I am kind of, I don't have a particular style, but I work with acrylic oils and sometimes mixed media. I am from Indian heritage and I was born and brought up in India till my marriage. 
I have my master's degree and I've worked in IT. So for a couple of years, I didn't do my art because of the job and kids and family. I live, I've lived mostly outside India after my marriage. Mostly it's US and Australia. Currently I'm in Austin, Texas with my husband and two teenagers. About my art journey. So my art journey started back in my teens and it all started with, uh, back in India, what happens usually we draw Rangpuli outside our houses and we do Hina tattoos on hand. So those Rangolis are basically modern mandalas. If you look right now, they are pretty much same as the Rangolis. So it all started happening at that time when I was young and I used to make Rangolis and I made uh, Hina tattoos on the hand. Mandalas basically are geometric shapes, repeated patterns, and they can include flowers. They have elaborate designs. Mandalas are basically ancient form of freedom, stress, and anxiety. Same with Hina, they are repeated patterns. So oh, while I was growing up, the Indian folk art also influenced my art a lot. So they have also had the repeated patterns in a large contest like village, peacock, fish. They used to draw day-to-day -day life and they will incorporate their, these intricate patterns in it. Once I moved to here, uh, because I was not so much able to do my art, having kids, small kids, and then having acrylic and paints not possible. So I started incorporating, incorporating Zen tangles into my life. So they're kind of abstract drawings and with the same kind of structured repeated patterns. And they're also kind of active meditation sort of. So for me, it's like I said, I don't have a particular style. So I say artist comes in many forms, but when it comes to creativity, it depends on the mood of the artist. Whatever the mood creates becomes their creativity. So that's why I said it's so different for everybody to see different, different art forms as they see art. So this is one of the paintings that I did in my teenager. And if you see, I did try to incorporate the lines and checks inside it. The bottom where the woman is sitting, that has the check patterns and all the shadow part, wherever it is, are the lines. So that was one of the first my oil paintings in my whole life that I did. Um, I think I was 16 at that time. So like I just used to paint normal. Uh, these intricate patterns kind of went away because I was doing job and kids were small. So I just used to paint sometime when kids are small and sleeping in that. So my usually works at that time has texture. So in this painting, if you see, I tried to put the texture showing that the sand under the water. So it's, it's like the texture that I use the modeling face and then it shows that the water is flowing on and the sand is inside. So usually we do see that part. This is one of the fall leaves that I painted and I really love the fall colors and I was so inspired that I had to do it. So this is one of the fall leaves that I painted. This is one of the costumes for Indian folk dance, and that is called Kalbelia dance. The name is Kalbelia dance, and it's a mixed media art. So if you see at the painting, all the jewelry are real metal jewelry, and all the work that is done is done with the lace. It's the lace work that I did to give the shape of the skirt in the way she is dancing. So after having so much busy time, my uh, art started coming back to me when I was dealing with depression and anxiety due to my health issues. And at that time, mandalas and zentangles and henas, henna work uh, came into a therapeutic way into my art. And I started incorporating the intricate intricate patterns in my paintings. So in this one, if you see, I did try a little bit, not so much, but over the time they increase. So it's what I've noticed, it depends on my mood a lot. If I'm too stressed out, my painting gets more 
of the black and white pattern. So this one is, it has more black and white. So the patterns when we use black and white, they have a psychological significance when they're used together. So white is serene, pure, and defines simplicity. Whereas black is strong, it evokes emotions of sadness. So what I notice that when I'm too sad or depressed, my patterns will have more black part than white. So it just happens and I just work on the paper like that. And then I usually do it when I'm sitting in a car or when I have no way to access canvas or anything. So it's just in my sketchbook and then I put them on the canvas or a good paper. So the patterns are usually black and white. And then slowly, slowly, I started incorporating more colors to it to apply the psychology of colors. So this is Shiva. So he's one of the god in Hindu mythology. And if you look at the hair, so these are all the patterns that are in mandalas, Zen tangles, and hinas. They're repeated patterns. They're, it's not, you can see the same pattern on this side and that side on the top also. I try to incorporate that. So this is another god of Hinduism. And he's, I named Rudra. So his one of his name is Rudra. Otherwise, he's famous as Sanuman, the monkey god. So over the time, I started adding colors to it. So I noticed that the colors, the more I add the colors, the psychology of colors starts affecting. The red is strong. The green gives the peace, calmness. So this is one of the Indian folk art, which is this painting is an abstract form of that because I incorporated different colors at the background. And the tree also I incorporated more patterns from the same. So each, this is mixed me like it has acrylic and oil both. And all the work is very detailed. And again, you see it's more black and white. I do try to add more colors, but if something feels like the black overtakes everything. This is, uh, I finished just two months back and I was influenced by the way the climate change is happening. And the middle part, I made the corals under the sea and around it is all the small shapes. If you see their houses, all the trees we are cutting to make our houses, that depicts deforestation. So this is one of the paintings that I did thinking of climate change that is happening on earth. So this is another one where I incorporated more colors and I call that the sun. So it's in the form of a sun, but it has more colors, more intricate patterns, more detailed work. It kind of takes hours for me and I wouldn't even know it, but, but I just keep doing it. So this is white peacock. It also has the same, so the patterns are same, pretty much the same, the lines, the patterns, but it's just that they come into different form. So this is that I finished last week. And it's actually these of my paintings will be on show in Hilson Coffee Shop in Austin, in the downtown Austin. So this is lush landscape. Basically it was just a watercolor. And then I was not happy with it. Just plain watercolor. So I started putting the patterns on it and it turned out like this. This is, I call it shipwreck. So the patterns of water, I got that in my dreams. I just saw that and then I had to put it on the paper. But for a couple of months, it was just like that but I couldn't finish what to put inside it. It felt like water, but I didn't know what to put. So then I put the broken ship inside. So that's another like how many ships are under the sea, just showing the water. This is Indian folk art. So these are the coasters I made for the one of the custom orders. And this is Madhubani art. It's Indian folk art. So you can see how it has detail and intricate patterns. So they are all done like that. And these are just one pieces. So if you see the whole Madhubani art, painting, so it will have whole canvas filled with details, but they incorporate things like animals, living things. 
because in folk art, it's usually what's happening during the day-to-day -day life. They're trying to do that. This is Warli, another Indian folk art. And this is a textured work again, just like the beach. And the, all the structure over there, the leaves, the tree, the people, they're all, I think, half inch above the canvas. So it's all that you can feel it. This is Kalam Korea, the one that's my background. That's the abstract form of it. And this is the exact form of how the Kalamkari usually looks. So this is like I started a long time back. So they were small canvases, easy to handle. And so in a nutshell, my work has more intricate patterns and texture work. So just be creative and keep creating. And I'll pass on to the next artist that is Leslie Pierce. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, my name is Leslie. I'm a former Austinite for many years. Um, glad to be here. I miss Austin. And um, so stay cool. I hear uh, that you're having some, some heat again, which I forget. I'm talking to you from San Diego. And thank you to the other wonderful artists here and to women and their work for having me. Um, I'm in my studio in Liberty Station. It's, an, it's a converted naval base in an area called Point Loma in San Diego. And I wanted to start today with where I was in Austin. So if you don't like uh, mail parts, you need to turn off or if you're offended, but 20 years ago, over 20 years ago now in Austin, I was, um, very well known for a series of paintings where I projected images of buildings onto men that were painted silver. Um, it was a projection series and it was, it was right before digital was coming on, believe it or not, it's hard to believe. So I've always been interested in um, concepts concerning man and technology and how it both brings us together, technology, but also fragments us and isolates people as a society. Um, I'm very political, which I won't, uh, I'll try to stay off politics on here, but um, as an artist, I feel that we should be able to express those things and it's important to me. So um, other things I'm interested in is beautiful surfaces that show something else underneath, something mysterious, something again, commenting on society. And one day I was printing out after experimenting with figure drawing. Um, we were doing modeled areas versus the abstract figurative. And so I printed out one of my reference images and my printer was running out of ink and it did this of lines across the image and that was it for me. It was everything, uh, you know, most people would throw it out, but for me it was like a surge, an electrical surge when I looked at it because it was abstract and figurative at the same time. And it also plays with positive and negative space flipping in and out. So I'm very interested in discovery and new media. I also do some 3D work, which I'll be incorporating in a, a, a small grant um, sponsored, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, a grant sponsored event that will be happening through Liberty Station in the fall, and then also December with an installation in my studio and another location. So I'm gonna take you for a walk around and let's see, I hope I'm not doing too many ums. I, I did try Toastmasters a long time ago. I didn't do too well a few meetings. So I'm just going to do a pan of my studio. And so this is a studio walk around. So sometimes I will do famous people. Um, if you know, here's my blondie, <laughs> one of my blondies. 
and um, I have a peacock here also. And this is the space I work in, and I also teach a lot. It's a couple hours earlier here. Oh, my head's too big. <laughs> it's a couple hours earlier here. Um, so I had to be aware of the time difference. Um, I do have one slide to share with you if you would like to know more about me and where to find out I, my artist statement, all the good stuff is on there. Um, I apologize for not having a wonderful uh, slideshow presentation. I'll, I'll know if, I, if I'm honored enough to do this again next time to have more prepared, but I will show you a close up of another painting here. So this, so this one took me a couple years. It's of Belmont Park in San Diego. And let's do more of a walkthrough since I know I have time here. It's a little messy back here, so cover your eyes. <laughs> All right, so this one over here in the back is the first one that started the series. So I'm really proud of that. I'm working on a Perry Mason <laughs> with lines. You know, a good angle of that, sorry. There we go. And uh, I don't have more to talk about. I'm glad to be here. And again, I'll share the screen if you, you're interested in my work and wanna find out more about me when I'm more awake. <laughs> here we are. Thank you all. Please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Hi, y'all. So um, we're going to open the floor to questions for anybody who has any. Um, if anybody's tuning in on Facebook, um, I'd like to invite you to uh, leave some comments and uh, we'll pass on the questions. Or if you'd like to put them in the chat here, I can ask them for you. Um, I do have a question for you, Leslie. I was wondering how you decide like where the the lines are gonna go when you're painting. Oh wait, I can't see who's asking. Um, it's me, Sophia. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't have <laughs> you're totally fine. Yeah. Um, well, that's a really good question. I it's I used to play, believe it or not, I used to play jazz flute. And I was very good at improvising. And it's almost like that when I'm working. Like I honestly, when I started the series in Austin, I would play really loud surf music. So it was like a, a precessor or I'm um, sorry. And um, I would move to the beat of the music and then change colors midline or a third of the way in that. So it changes and um, I want to play with light and shadow in a, a long string almost, um, or a, a line. So I, it changes. That's a really good question. Uh, I want to make sure that you could tell what the form is. So like if I did a silhouette around it, you could still tell what it was. But it instead of doing wraparound contour lines, it's flattening it almost like barcodes, but in color. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I kind of see familiarity between all of your work um, and the fact that you guys are all layering a lot of different things and there's such meaning behind it. So I'm wondering if you guys can talk about that uh, amongst the three of you and see sort of if you guys have any similarities in that where you're making decisions and things? Oh, there we go. You're I'd be muted. curious to know from the other artists, do you intentionally start out knowing there's going to be pattern or how does the pattern come into your work? Uh, for me, it's like 
it started happening, like I said, when I was dealing with depression and these came up. So what I used to do, I used to do them on, okay. So I used to do them on the paper first. So these, these were my start points where I did mostly on the paper. And when people saw them and they asked if I can do them on canvas for them. So these were all the intricate patterns that I usually did. And it's, a, it's like when I work with lines and patterns, they just come up to me. It's not like, I don't know what the next line is going to be, but somehow it's pretty much working and it's kind of what I felt, it's therapeutic. It really helps me get over the issues that I'm dealing with and helps me overcome a lot of stress. And after a few hours, I'm like back to myself not so much stressed. So these are recently like, this one is work in progress. So I think I have to remove my background, just a second. So this is another work in progress on a canvas and it's a custom order. So it's, I'm still working on the hair part, if you see. So this one, um, this one. So they are together. So her hair is still to be done. So it's just that I've made these lines and then I will incorporate more of the patterns that I did in here on the hair for him. I'll do the same for her. So they're kind of like come to me by itself. It's not a specific way that I think or I do. So they're pretty I just keep small papers with me to keep those doing them. And the ones I really like, I put them on the canvas. So it basically happens with my mood. So there's no specific that comes to me. It's just what happens inside me comes on, on the paper. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how about you, Leslie? Do you have a way like do you know, like, can you see it in advance? Like, you know where the line work is going to be or how it's going to evolve? Thank you so much for that question because um, if, and I will promise myself again that I'm working on a really large one that's buried behind other work where I was doing vertical lines and it was of waves. And that is really difficult. So for that, I think I'm gonna take a rest from the waves because it's horizontal by nature. So to try and make it look like a wave by changing the colors vertically was, was much harder. But for people, I love eyes. And so I'm gonna definitely do some here and the eyebrows, I love that. And I'll do some of the lips and on the neck. But then the other, um, lately, like with Blondie, Blondie Babe over here. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can line it up right. Here she is. Um, you really can't, I don't think you can see, but there's some subtle lines on the face, like almost like scratch marks and she was a punk rocker. So that seemed to fit more. Um, so some of them are more commercial because I, you know, I do sell paintings and um, let's see if I could show you. I've done it with uh, horses, although I don't do any more horse races since that's a no, no, I, I found out how bad they treat the horses. With this one, this is one of my favorite ones. And uh, well, I always wind up going political, but I did this in 2014 and it's called American Dreamers. And um, hopefully this is coming out. Is it blurry? Um, maybe it's good. And then, okay, I'm gonna get one more political. <laughs> There's AOC. Okay, so um, <laughs> I can never do it. Even if, even when I'm teaching, I try not to, but it always I always go there. Um, so for faces, I've been doing. I do less on the whole face now. I want to play with the modeling and shadow and bring some realism in, but not too much because I I personally in my own work get bored with it. If it gets too realistic, I want it to be more modern, so then I'll bring that in. So thank you for the question. 
And I would like to know where you find all of your vintage <laughs> products because there's no half price books here. <laughs> right. Well, you know, it's people always ask that. And the, the real truth is that now that I work like this, people know it. And the very best things that I find, they somebody brings them to me. You know, they old Aunt oh, Hilda that's... passed away and oh, here's this box of junk. Do you want it? <laughs> And so I'm always like, yes. And it is tricky because the things that I'm drawn to, again, because they're so mundane, they typically don't show up in antique stores. They're not valuable enough for that. And then I generally need a large quantity of them as well. And that can be problematic, particularly if they're, they're vintage or old. Um, is so, that because you're working large? They yeah, large yeah. Time. And I... Yeah, and I, I feel pretty strongly. I will almost always use just one single source per, per piece. Occasionally, like for like these Life Magazine ones, they were from different uh, editions or different issues, but they were all from Life Magazine. And for, part of that for me is that a printed piece has a look and feel to the font, the color palette, the weight of the paper. And when you start mixing those, it, it's collage, it, you know, it, it can um, almost veer into um, a little bit childlike if you're not careful. And because there's so much going on in these and so many layers, they need to, I need to bring it down a notch, you know, otherwise it's just too chaotic. So what are ways to simplify? And one of them is through color. And then another is making sure that they're kind of all from the same source and that helps unify it. Um, but, but because of that, the, whatever those materials are made from can really impact what I'm able to do with it. You know, so like a really old document book or something like say from the twenties, it's very fragile and um, you know, will crumble on you. I used to do, my work was almost always in with encaustic with the wax, but that's just too harsh for a really old paper. It's just going to crumble or turn brown. And so that's where I, I started moving into the acrylic and, and uh, those kind of mediums that you can create layers of protection before you start monkeying around with how you want to add paint or uh, that. And so like some of them, I have deep layers of resin in between to kind of preserve one layer before I go on and start adding more, knowing that I've sort of saved that first layer. Um, Thank you. Kirti, I was interested in you for yours. How do you, how do you feel scale impacts it? Like, do you prefer to work at a bigger size or does, how do you make that decision for yourself? Can you repeat? Yeah, it was about scale. How do you decide how big it's going to be? I mean, I'm curious to know, they feel so intricate that do you feel they change when they get bigger in scale versus when they're smaller? Actually, I usually draw them smaller, the grid style I said. So that kind of helps me go with more designs in a small amount of time. So if you see the grid doesn't have that much of pattern. Oops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it doesn't have that much of intricate patterns that I start doing later. Mm -hmm. So once I finish doing these, I know how the patterns are going to be. And then I start working on it based on whatever comes to me. So I just put that in there. It's just when it comes, it comes. Sometimes it happens like I'm totally stuck and I'm not able to do for a couple of months. So I leave that painting on the side. I keep it in my view because I know something is going to come up. And then I start doing working on it on the other ones. And while working on the other ones, it just clicks me, okay. Like the shipwreck one. The shipwreck one was in front of me on the wall for a couple of months till I thought, okay, I can put a ship over here because it looks like water. And so it just, it's not something, it totally depends on my mood. So if, and that really happens when I'm really happy, it's hard to create for me. <laughs> so I kind of get stuck when I'm kind of happy and jolly. So it's, more happens when I'm kind of in a bad mood or depressed. <laughs> the more things come up at that time. I 
think that brings up a good question. Do all three of you work on multiple pieces at one time or do you have like singular vision? Can you describe that at all? I definitely work on multiple at once because I, I'm, um, I do guerrilla artists. Like if I have my palette out, I want to think where else can I use the paint? And for me, it's easier. And I love working large. And one of the reasons is I don't have to have my brushes in good shape. If you're painting small, you need them in really good shape. So I don't have to buy brushes as much if I'm, it's easier to go large. And I love the feeling like a little kid of feeling like you're gonna walk into a painting to set that, that wonderful feeling when you're in a museum and, and you have something really big in front of you. Yeah. I always work on multiple, but that's um, one of the challenges I find is I typically have at least one or two commissions going on simultaneously. And so that's, you know, a very different, it could be very different palette or style. You know, it's, it's based usually, you know, commissions are almost always based on something in the past. But that doesn't mean that's where my headspace is right now. And so that's a real challenge. And I know that's why some artists don't like commissions. And I'm anyone who knows me well knows I bitch about it about uh, every day, practically like, oh, I'm not going to do any more of that. But um, I, I still find there's enough benefit in taking on that work. But it is really hard to separate it from the, the body of work that, that you want to be working on. So same for me, like I work simultaneously on two or three paintings and mostly the ones left out are the ones I can't think of how to do more on it. So I have around two of them still hanging. So they're still in work in progress. So whenever something clicks on it and I'll start working on it and leave the one that I'm working on because when something clicks, I don't want it to go away. It's like, it's like uh, I, I, if you guys have read the, uh, read the big magic book called Elizabeth Gilbert. So she says that creativity comes to you when you more use it. So it's like when something comes to me, I instantly leave the ones that I am doing because I know I have that in mind. And I go back on the ones that I'm stuck for months and I'll work on them. So yeah. I always say the most valuable time in the studio is the, the first like two minutes when I walk in, because when, when I open the door and turn on the light, like whatever kind of catches my eye is usually the thing that needs attention. And it's suddenly like, I've been away from it long enough that it's like, oh, well, it's that corner or like, oh, that color palette needs some contrast or something. But seeing it that with those fresh eyes and just that little moment is just magic. And then after I've been there for a while, I can't see it anymore. <laughs> you know, then I've become blind to it. So I usually work uh, from my home. So because we moved to Austin in 2020 when the COVID hit, I'm still kind of new to Austin because for one and a half didn't leave the house, one and a half year didn't leave the house. So still my studio is in my bedroom. So it's kind of like whatever, whenever something strikes, I come back, leave everything and do that. It's very easy. I don't think I could sleep if they were in there with me. <laughs> <laughs> they would be gnawing away and complaining. <laughs> lying on the bed and I suddenly think of something and I get up. And it feels like I can put a curtain or some partitions so I don't look at the paintings and think about it. <laughs> By the way, that book you mentioned is, is wonderful, um, Big Magic by, um, I'm blanking on her name, it's a little, uh, Gilbert, right? Big Magic? Yeah, Elizabeth Gilbert, Big Magic. Elizabeth Gilbert, yeah. yeah. Actually, are there any other books that you all, or um, anything inspiring? I kind of more, I kind of more read like, which helps me. Like right now, I'm reading the 
eternal soul. So it's you can't see it, I don't think. Oops, okay. I'll keep the background off. So I'm reading this one right now. So that's one of the good ones. And it's more about like healing. So it's mm -hmm. radical forgiveness. So these kind of books help me a lot. So you can heal your life. So my See, basically we have that in common. That's on my to do that I'm supposed to read Louise and learn about her <laughs> hay rides and how she impacted um, the the sort of self help category from the eighties. So we'll be sharing that one. I may have to call you and see your insight on it. <laughs> the problem for me now is that I'm, I'm not reading them straight through. And so pretty soon they're just going to be one giant self-help book that starts with Benjamin Franklin and somehow ends up at, um, you know, Stephen Covey or somebody, I don't know. <laughs> I read um, technique books, so it's pretty boring. <laughs> To, to learn more. And then occasionally I'll read uh, Rachel Maddow, MSNBC, um, nice. political and technique books. But, um, but I do like things like Napoleon Hill, like success through a positive mental attitude. I'll go back to that if I'm, you know, if I'm feeling like I'm, I'm in a rut and I'm feeling down, there's um, that kind of reading inspirational things will just quotes out of that will help. Like there's uh, one of my favorite ones from Napoleon Hill is with every adversity, there's a seed of a, an equivalent benefit. And that's been really helpful to me through really trying times. There's a, a book that the original one is called The Daily Rituals, How Artists Work. By, if I was looking at it, I'm trying to I always forget his name. Uh, but he has a second book out that's only about the women artists. It's wonderful. Like, I, I, I don't know, I'm a bit, uh, Mason Curry is the author on that. And he just does little snippets on kind of what was the daily routine. And it might be a painter or a photographer or a musician or a writer and goes back in history. But it's just, A, it's sort of voyeuristic fun, but it's also really interesting to see the commonalities in all of us. And, and I don't know, when I read the first one, which he admitted was um, pretty remiss. He didn't have very many women artists in the first book, but it, it was really comforting to read because it was at a point in my life where I felt like I couldn't give enough of my hours of a day or a week. And therefore that meant to me, I wasn't a real artist or I couldn't be a real artist. And when I went back and was reading some of these stories about these other uh, artists, it, you start to find out like very few creative works in creative nine hour bursts. You know, it's shorter pockets. It's it's three, four, you know, max maybe five. But then there are these other times of the day that need to be filled in with gathering input. You know, so whether that's you're going to your salon, the salon, and having a, a artsy conversation, or you're going for a walk down the street, um, or you're reading and and you're giving that your time for your brain just to make up connections and see things and how that how valuable that is. And so anyway, it was just a big kind of a uh, refreshing release of like, no, I'm not that far off actually. And, it, you know, I'm actually a lot like all these other folks. And so I like both of those books. It's not easy being an artist. <laughs> but it, Boy, I think you even said, you know, it's like, what other profession would you, um, from whatever money you make, go and spend it on more supplies? You know, it's like so that you could do more of that work. You know, it's like I, I used to practice law. And if someone had said, OK, if you work really, really hard and you're really good at it, you can practice more law. I've just been like, ah, you know, just shoot me now. <laughs> but, that's, you know, that is what the mentality is for artists. It's like we either go buy each other's work or we, you know, spend it on new supplies for ourselves so we can do more of our own work. Awesome, you guys. I really enjoyed all of the conversation and all of the questions that you guys uh, answered. Um, do you have anything that is coming up soon that you guys want to share with everybody? Can you repeat what you said? Um, if, I'm just wondering if you have any um, 
uh, events or shows or anything coming up that you guys wanted to share with everybody? Uh -huh. Well, we go ahead. <coughs> I have one coming up at uh, it's Hilson Coffee Shop uh, on, in Austin downtown. So from probably till whole July, my paintings will be there. <coughs> Excuse me. I have an outdoor event uh, grant sponsored in September called Uplifting Gestures. I'm doing a collaborative event with Malashak Dance Company. I'll be leading um, drawing, gesture drawing, and they'll and we'll have a behind the scenes. The cura not the curator, sorry, the choreographer <laughs> is going to talk, bring us and tell people about. Um, how he works with the dancers and I'm really excited about that. And then in December, I'll have two art installations. I'll actually be using encaustic and bringing in some of the participants' drawings, gesture drawings into that in an art installation. And also my first video mapping installation. I've been playing with that for a while. I, um, know a little 3D and after effects. So I wanted to bring some video into it. And, and I'm gonna grab a book about women artists. If you haven't read it yet, you probably know which one I'm talking about, but I can't remember the title. So I wanted to show you. Yeah. And we here at Canopy, we now have our monthly open canopy, which is the first Saturday of each month from one to four. And those are actually pretty nice because unlike the East Austin Studio Tour where it's so crowded, these are nice. There's usually a sponsor like Deep Eddie or somebody like that. So it's fun, but it is a, a, a little more relaxed way to um, get to talk to the artist. That's a fabulous book. It's, it's monstrously big, Ninth Street Women, but it's a, a bit of a doorstop, but it's well worth it to keep <laughs> with it. Um, it's really good. And then actually I was going to say, I, I'm off to a, um, uh, workshop in Montana with one of our listeners, Paige Booth, um, who's the, who found it for us. It's a wonderful artist, Rebecca Hutchinson, who does paper making. And I'm really curious. She does these interesting sculptures from them. So I'm really, and paper clay and things like that. So I'm really curious to learn some other processes and just see what that brings up for me. And then Paige was reminding me, I, I have a, a podcast um, where I interview other artists from around the world about the different professions or experiences that have allowed them to create the work they're doing now. And so that's called Art-ish, A-R-T-I-S-H, Plunge. And it comes up, usually comes out once a week, although when I'm really busy, it's not quite as frequent. <laughs> but, um, but there are plenty of back episodes that are really interesting. So. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that today is the last day to see um, Alexandra Robinson's show. Delimitations are words to live by before we close for about a week uh, in preparation for Steve Crombatch's One Bad Monkey. That'll be opening on the 25th from 7 to 9 p.m. And I hope to see you guys there. Um, thank you so much for, for coming on and talking about everything with us. And uh, we had such a great time. Um, and you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much, everyone. We'll see y'all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Yeah, me too. Bye bye.